Holly, what have you got for us first this time? All right, Craig. Number one this week, and hopefully you can hear it through Ada's cries. Can you actually hear it? Oh, that's no, good. No, My no. microphone is sufficiently directional. Um, number one is, and sorry if I'm a bit vague this week, mate, but um, I'll do my best. Be explicit about connection. And so this, this is an idea that kind of was prompted um, by some of the work that Sarah Cottingham has done in one of her particular blog posts. But then I've kind of built upon it um, with a couple of other examples that I'd like to give you today as well. So the the kind of quote or excerpt I've got is keep students's students's keep I told you I'd be vague today keep students meaning making within the range of acceptable meaning by picking up a specific thread of prior knowledge and stitching it into the new idea so let me let me explain this often when we're teaching what we're trying to get students to do is make meaningful and reasonable connections between knowledge but one of the perils of teaching is often the connection we think we're supporting students to make is not actually the connection that they're making. So the example that um, Sarah gives is, for example, we could talk about the star-crossed lovers in Romeo and Juliet, but a student could think that cross means angry, right? And think that Romeo and Juliet are kind of in some sort of a fight or argument, or they were having an argument, which is something that often happens in teenage relationships anyway, uh, and they could they could come to some confusing conclusion based upon this. So what Sarah means when she says, pick up a thread and stitch it into the new knowledge is be really clear about the connection you want the students to make. So in this case, she says, the thread is, you know, you could say you want students to connect this idea to knowledge of fate and destiny. And I'll, I'll just read from an article here. I do this by reminding them of the importance of astrology and that some of the audience may believe in the power of the stars to govern people's destinies. I stitch this together with the new concept, star-crossed lovers, by saying this means that Romeo and Juliet's stars are misaligned, their love is fated to end in tragedy. So she's been really clear about that. This was also brought up in my recent podcast discussion with Daniel Willingham, which is hopefully coming out tomorrow, actually, if I manage to do some edits tonight. Um, and the example that he gives is, a, a lecturer might be talking about Shirley Temple and might say something like, you know, a lot of movies starring Shirley Temple came out during the 1930s. They were meant to make their audience feel good and forget about their troubles, and they, and they were very popular. So a student listening to that might think, okay, cool. So I pretty much understood that whole sentence. You know, movies came out, they made feel, people feel good. It was in the 1930s, uh, and they were very popular. But in this case, the, the connection that the lecturer actually wants the students to make or the teacher is that, well, these films were being made in the 1930s in America, which was during the Great Depression, which this lecturer was ta talked about, you know, a week ago or a fortnight ago. And the reason why the Shirley Temple um, films were really popular was because they offered an opportunity for people to escape the depression of the time because they were really fun, right? And so without the lecturer explicitly making that connection for students, taking that thread uh, from about the Great Depression from a prior lecture and stitching it into this current lesson, students you know, it's unfair for us to expect them to make that connection. Uh, and, and a way that this can kind of apply to mathematics, I think, is talking a little bit about, I don't know if you recall in Tools for Teachers, I'm not sure if you saw this section, Craig, but it's kind of, I've sketched a knowledge tree of the structure of an expert using Pythagoras' theorem. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like, what does an expert do when they're using Pythagoras' theorem? Well, first they ask, is it a right angled triangle? If it is, they might be able to use Pythagoras' theorem. If it isn't, they can't. Um, if it's yes, they need to ask, do we? Do they have the lengths of two sides and they're missing one? And so on and so forth. So one of the ways that we can make these connections really explicit in mathematics, I think, is by explicitly mapping out the kind of knowledge structures that we're hoping students to take on and then providing them with practice actually navigating those knowledge structures. So yeah, that's the first, that, that's the idea. Uh, be explicit about the connections you want students to make. Love it, Ollie. Right, okay, you've got four things uh, for you here. So the first is, uh, this is making my day, the fact that you're obviously at the early stages of your big collapse that I've been predicting. Now, you know, you've got, you <laughs> can't say words, your thoughts are all over the place. I've been Students. waiting this day. Yeah, this is well, it. there this you go, is Craig. It. So, and again, listeners, we'll, we'll track this over the coming years when Ollie, I mean, he's struggling with words, next month, sentences, entire thoughts, he'll just be a wreck. So I'm very much enjoying that. So that's number one. Um, second, 
Sarah Cottingham, she's fantastic, hey? So I had her on tips for teachers. I'm, I need to do a big deep dive, like three-hour three hour epic with her because she's super smart and got, yeah, lo loads of good things to say. So if listeners haven't checked out Sarah's work, put a link to that in the show notes. She's a fantastic, absolutely brilliant person. Um, it's interesting, the maths link. Now this, I don't know if this is related to this or not, but I've been thinking about this over the last few days and this seems like a good point to bring it up. You know, um, you know, polysemous words, and again, if listeners aren't familiar with these, these are words that have um, different, sound exactly the same, but have different meanings. And they're, they're really problematic for kids. So a really good one in maths is similar, because the meaning of the word similar in a maths classroom is really specific. It means two shapes, one's an enlargement of the other, whereas similar in the rest of the world just means are oh, a little bit alike. Now, I think teachers are really good at when they're teaching similarity, emphasizing exactly what similar means. I don't think that's the problem. I'll tell you what I think the problem is, and again, you just triggered me to think of this now. Whenever you're not teaching about similarity, I think the word similar, you just drop it in left, right, and center, as you would do in like normal conversation. So you could be then, you know, talking about equations or whatever, and say, oh, those two equations are quite similar to each other. Because you're not even thinking similarity, but it goes back to your point there. If the kids are, are kind of latching on, they've remembered this meaning of similar that you've really emphasized, then all of a sudden that's potentially quite confusing. And again, we I, I certainly would never even consider this, but I've just noticed it in a few lessons I've been watching recently where technical vocabulary has been used, but used in kind of the everyday sense. So I, I thought that was, that was interesting. Um, and the final thing, and then I'll shut up and let you come back on any of these. Yeah, I absolutely loved your um, the way you structured your Pythagoras kind of way of, way of thinking in, in tools for teachers. It reminds me of similar things um, I used to do when I taught A-level um, for integration. How do you know which integration method to use? If it looks like this, do this. This is the thing I'm looking for and so on and so forth. It makes me realize how powerful those flow diagrams, for want of a better word, how powerful they are if you've got a novice to help them start to structure their thinking and get to the stage where you can just look at something and intuitively know it's Pythagoras or it's integration by parts or whatever. I think they're really underappreciated, our, um, our, our flow diagrams. And I think, yeah, they've, they've certainly got wider implications than, than, than I, I myself have, have made use of. Um, anything on any of that, all? Yeah, totally. Just to riff on that last bit a little bit, it's something that came out of my chat with Dan Willingham as well, and that is that, you know, knowledge is structured in, in the network, right? And so not, the way that knowledge is structured is actually like these kind of concept or flow diagrams. But communication, because of the way that time flies, you know, like an arrow, straightforward, must be sequential. Therefore, what we're actually doing when we're teaching, we're trying to take something that's inherently within a network structure, turn it into a sequence in such a way that when students reconstruct it in their own minds, they're turning it back into a network. And so like, it's just a monumentally and fundamentally really challenging task. Uh, and so one way to kind of circumvent that and not have to go via the, such a sequential approach is to just provide students with the network in and of itself. And that is one way coming back to the kind of the, the core idea is to be really explicit about the connections and multiple connections at the same time. Lovely that all, lovely that. Um, I tell you what, if listeners are playing a drinking game here and you uh, your kind of keyword was Dan Willingham, you'd already be on your way to being hammered now. I think we're all aware Ollie's interviewing my hero, Dan Willingham, here. So listen, listen, listen out for that one. <laughs> there you go. What's your number one, Craig? Craig. <laughs> 